Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Kathy Jacobs, and I'm the director of the Center for Climate Adaptation Science and Solutions at the University of Arizona. Uh, and we are very happy to help sponsor this event, which is within the Arizona Institutes for Resilience, which I'll um, describe a little further in a minute. Um, we are going to uh, be doing a poll before we begin our program today just to find out a little bit more about who our audience is. Um, so please go ahead and be filling out the form um, as, as you proceed here. Um, we will be using the chat box for question and answer. So please, if you have any feedback for the panelists, uh, put that in the chat as we go along. Um, there won't be uh, regular interruptions to respond to the chat, but that will happen towards the end of the program. We are recording this event, um, so we just want to make sure everybody is aware that's the case. Um, the intent is simply to be able to provide uh, an opportunity for people to review this material in the future. It will be posted on our website. And uh, we do want to make sure that you fill out the poll um, before the, just in the next few minutes, if you wouldn't mind. Um, we want to acknowledge before we begin uh, that the University of Arizona, which is hosting this event, uh, occupies the original homelands of the Tohono O'odham and Pascua Yaqui nations, indigenous peoples who have stewarded this, this, stewarded this land since time immemorial. Just a, a brief uh, introduction to the Arizona Institutes for Resilience. Um, this is a constellation of various programs and projects that were within the University of Arizona in the past, but have now been combined uh, for greater impact, uh, both within the campus and off campus. Our intent is really to help promote resilience uh, on multiple scales. Uh, the vision is to address the crises of climate and global environmental change head on and to make the University of Arizona the go-to place for students and faculty committed to managing climate and environmental risks and building equitable and effective solutions to these challenges. Um, please feel free to check out our website if you wanna know more about what we're up to. Uh, finally, I'm going to share with you the agenda for today um, before I turn it over to the organizers. Um, first, uh, we will hear an introduction um, to the uh, bri Bridging Biodiversity and Conservation Science Program from Brian Enquist. Um, there'll then be uh, a bit about the National Science Foundation collaboration from Rob Anderson. There are three speakers, Paolo Cadre, Erica Johnson, and Robbie Berger. Uh, there will be a brief question and answer session and then we will go into breakout sessions, which are focused on answering um, specific questions that are connected to the topics that are going to be discussed today. Um, there will be report outs from those groups and then uh, a summary in terms of key takeaways, wrap up and next steps, uh, noting that this is all moving towards a collaborative uh, synthetic publication. So with that, uh, I'm going to stop screen sharing and turn it over uh, to Brian, but I do want to uh, get the results of the poll if we could. So um, we, are, we have a pretty even split, it looks like, between uh, graduate students, early career professionals, and mid-late career scientists or professionals. Um, we also have almost 100% scientific academic researchers, um, which is an important thing to understand who the audience is. Uh, and I will turn it over to Brian. Uh, thanks to all of you for joining us today. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to um, help kick off uh, this workshop um, on an incredibly important topic um, that uh, is near and dear to, to many of us. Um, my name is Brian Enquist. I'm a professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology 
And together with Casey Ernst, who's in the, um, uh, the College of Public Health here at the University of Arizona, um, we head up a group known as the Bridging Biodiversity and Conservation Science um, Group here at the University of Arizona within, um, within AIR that you just heard of. And so I want to give you just a little bit of context um, for why, um, why this workshop is happening. Um, we initiated the BBCS program here at the University of Arizona because um, many of us across campus in different units kind of all, all throughout the university increasingly realized that many of the kind of key questions that we wanted to answer have to do with this cutting edge research that is at the interface of many different sub disciplines but and 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 many of these questions have to kind of deal with these important issues having to do with the intersection of public health environmental security food security national security and biodiversity is kind of right in the middle of this and there's this kind of this bigger challenge having to do with how do we forecast the future of biodiversity and what does that mean for human health food the environment and national security, right? So biodiversity is at the center. A key component of the BBCS is to develop a mechanism by which we can better train and mentor the next generation of leaders, um, grappling with these fundamental issues and challenges. But an important component of this is to also engage in outreach and to help kind of not only kind of integrate what's happening here at the University of Arizona, but also integrate other leading researchers across the United States, internationally, and so on. So why BBCS? Why are we doing this? Well, again, many of our major societal challenges are these cross-unit challenges that have biodiversity at the center. And increasingly with IPBES and the United Nations efforts and the Convention of Biological Diversity, um, there are increasing funding sources and, and opportunities to support the training of not only students on, on these interfaces, but also to address these cutting edge scientific problems. So we have a lot of strength here at the University of Arizona and across our different collaborators in you know, different universities, both in the US and internationally, but we have very few mechanisms by which to kind of foster and develop interactions okay, between units and across different countries. And so the BBCS is a conduit then to try to link local, national, and international goals then and efforts. So what is BBCS? We think of it as a research incubator network, okay? Kind of fueled from seed funds from the University of Arizona, as well as additional grants then that we try to go for to kind of support um, our work. Um, we try to develop this conduit to really develop faster collaborations, again, focused then on these issues. All right, so if we have this mechanism for cross-unit interactions, the real fuel then behind then the BBCS is this postdoc program. And so many of our postdocs are actually associated with, oh my gosh, my dogs are going crazy here. Excuse me, zoom, uh, zoom moment. But of the underlying uh, fundamentals of the BBCS program is this postdoc program. And so Robbie is one of our key postdocs within the BBCS postdoc program. And these postdocs are really the glue then that help them inter, uh, kind of intersect and kind of link up all of our various different uh, collaborators across campus and across different units. So with that being said, let's step back and focus in on what is really important. And that is this landscape and this amazing environment that surrounds us in the Southwest, but also draws international researchers um, to study fundamental questions only in biodiversity, but also conservation science, as well as the intersection between biodiversity and people. So the Sky Islands, not only are they incredibly beautiful, but they're a source of inspiration and extremely unique biodiversity. And surprisingly, we are still learning a tremendous amount about the biodiversity of the Southwest. And in part because of the Sky Islands, they are not only a generator of biodiversity, but they also harbor biodiversity from past climatic variability. And so with that being said, it's my absolute honor to sit back and start to ponder, not only walking through these wonderful, cool forests on top of these sky islands, but also to introduce Rob Anderson. Um, and so Rob, it's fantastic to, uh, to interact with you, at least virtually here. And it's great then uh, to have a chance to formally introduce you. So Rob, why don't you go ahead and take it away? And apologies for my dogs. 
they seem to have really good timing. Thank you. Um, yes, um, such a nice partnership here um, with Brian's group and with Arizona overall. Um, this is uh, really exciting. What I'd like to do is give a, a, a very short overview, a little bit about Sky Islands and um, the grant that I'm uh, leading, um, which has been the reason why we reached out uh, via Robbie um, to many people at Arizona to put this together. So overall, thinking about predicting the current and future biotas of Sky Islands, we live in a, a very patchy and dynamic Earth. And it's also a situation where range forecasts uh, are very needed by IPCC and other um, and by other intergovernmental organizations, as well as national entities uh, and regional and local ones. So, what's the Sky Island? Um, Brian showed you some of them. Um, they were classically uh, uh, made famous um, in the systems of the Western US, but they occur all over the world. And this is uh, some uh, pictures of one in Venezuela, a very, very small sky island, uh, Cerro Santana. And so somehow there is some form of forested vegetation um, associated with music cooler conditions on uh, at higher elevations, surrounded by a lowland of more xeric vegetation, for example, a, um, a xeric thorn scrub here. On Santana, if you uh, hike up to where the arrow uh, points to number two, you, you get to a dwarf cloud forest. And then on a clear day, hiking to the very top uh, in the center picture, uh, you can look down to the whole mountain and see how this uh, little, little patch of music vegetation is surrounded by um, a sea of drier areas. So in this patchy dynamic earth uh, that we live in, it's important to understand um, differences in suitability and connectivity among patches. And so we'll be talking a bit um, hopefully every week about the constraint-based model of dynamic island biogeography uh, proposed um, recently uh, led by Robbie. He'll be speaking about that. And this is uh, applicable at any spatial scale, but begins with the biogeographic perspective. And there's now an interface um, being more tightly developed with regional and local uh, perspectives, um, especially from meta-community theory. To achieve this synthesis, I think there's three things that we need to focus on. And that's understanding the roles of regional versus local processes in determining local species communities. Um, differences among species in how they uh, perceive the environment. So differences regarding suitability of patches, the effective area of patches, and the connectivity among patches, which will vary for different species. Um, and then considering the roles of environmental history. For all of this, it's important to think of the difference between contingency and determinism. So which deterministic processes can we um, you know, predict their effects if we can measure the right things today versus what things do we need to look to the past and look at uh, contingent events in the past in order to understand what is happening today and predict what will happen in the future. So that's an overall agenda. Um, the grant that's been mentioned here, I should say, I'm not from the National Science Foundation. I'm faculty at City College of New York, but we have an NSF grant that began last year. Um, and this is uh, titled Predicting Mammalian Communities in Mesoamerican Sky Islands Using Species Traits and Spatial Temporal Patterns of Environmental Suitability. So in this grant, uh, we are uh, applying and expanding uh, the CDIB model. Um, this is in collaboration uh, with Robbie Berger, three colleagues in Mexico, and two of my PhD students. Today, uh, Robbie and Erica Johnson will be speaking, and next week, uh, Aya Vasquez will be giving a talk. And with regard to um, this model, we're going to be doing uh, three things. One is um, expanding the theory, or deepening the theory by a mathematical formalization, uh, conducting uh, tests of predicted patterns in Venezuelan and Mexican sky islands, um, focusing on Mexico, but also taking advantage of a uh, data set that I already had in Venezuela, and then expanding to consider genetic repercussions and evolutionary processes. Um, and Gonzalo Pinilla is involved in this part of it. Cross-cutting all of these areas are applied needs, which was why we had the idea of this workshop, to see what needs there are for conservation management um, that we can address by somehow expanding uh, this model um, 
and linking with other existing models. So I'd like uh, to thank you all and all of these funding sources that have um, uh, been important for our work in Mexico so far and our ongoing projects. And now it's a real pleasure to introduce Paolo Cuadribarba, who is Conservation Director at the Sky Island Alliance. Um, I think he's the perfect moderator uh, for this overall series of uh, workshops. Um, and his research includes the ecophysiology of high elevation trees, factors influencing the local economic impacts of protected areas, and conservation and restoration strategies in fragmented and climate-threatened landscapes. So thank you so much, and um, I hope this is a, a great and stimulating um, exercise uh, for everyone involved. Thanks a lot, Rob. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen now. All right, thank you. Uh, well, it's, uh, it's a really an honor to have been invited to be a, a moderator and a presenter here, and for multiple reasons. First is because there's an incredible group of scientists here, and um, and uh, being director of uh, Conservation Sky and Alliance, it's, I, I've been only here for a year, but I've, I've been able to um, get an idea of how much, you know, we do our own science at a certain scale, but of course we need much more. And uh, I, I believe these, these groups are uh, some of the key um, um, elements that we need to, to be able to do our, our, our work much better. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. I'm also honored because I myself, um, I'm a transplant, I'm a Sky Island transplant because I was born in Mexico City and I grew up in those Sky Islands down there in the uh, transvolcanic belt. Uh, and I, I, I'm in love, I've been in love with them since then. And now I have the opportunity to be working in uh, more Northern ones. Um, so it's a real pleasure to be able to share this, this forum in particular. Um, so I'm gonna talk just uh, a little bit first, you know, we, we were just mentioning how incredibly biodiverse and unique these, these uh, sky islands that, um, that over here in Sonora and Arizona are, just because of the unique combination of species uh, that we can see from the new tropics and then the temperate areas, of course, it, uh, you know, including these two guys running the show uh, up here. Uh, but also because as a conservation organization, we've been facing in, you know, incredible uh, threats that, um, um, seems sometimes uh, really unbelievable and, and sort of unsurmountable, like the recent construction of the border wall in the big stretches of the of the Mexico-U.S. border, but also with problems of fragmentation and conflict between you know, carnivores and uh, and um, ranchers, for example, that we experience every day, and of course climate change and problems with mining, the mining industry and pollution in, in some of these areas. As an organization, as Canada Alliance, we, as I was saying, we, uh, a lot of our strength, a lot of our muscles come from uh, citizen-based science um, and, and also the support of a lot of foundations and, and different partners. One of our main focuses right now has been our border wildlife study. Uh, at, maybe some of you are familiar with it, where we have a big array of cameras spanning about 30 kilometers in one of the few stretches of border that doesn't have a border wall yet, where we've been able for a year to document uh, the presence of uh, different species of mammals and birds and, and uh, other other taxa too, but where we've been finding um, pre preliminarily, but you know, important declines in the in the number of detections that we see for different species. Um, other main focus of work has to do with water and what is happening to water sources in these uh, in these arid ecosystems and in the mountains, in the and in the sky islands. We are using again uh, citizen-based tools like uh, smartphone apps through survey one, two, three, for example, where we can, anyone that is hiking around the Sky Islands can actually collect a lot of information from uh, spring and water sources and upload it automatically to our data uh, databases where we can do some analysis on the condition, flow, uh, different species composition of spring ecosystems. Um, and, but we also working in other things related more to advocacy and policy. We work a lot with the National Park Service, with a, lot with, a lot with CONAM, for example, precisely on trying to help them understand or help support them in what kind of research is that they need. Um, and so um, this is why I value so much to be here today. Um, and, you know, among the big questions for Skyline Conservation that we as an organization uh, uh, experience and ask ourselves day to day, uh, of course, we can, you know, there's three, these three main uh, groups of, of topic or big topics, like including climate change, habitat fragmentation, and invasive species um, that are very particular to the uh, ecosystems that we work on here. And, and the questions that we have have to do on like, how, how are these processes of global environmental change affecting um, 
uh, restoration and, and approaches and goals and how do we manage those land and ecosystem management conservation priorities and instruments that we can use and how should they be changed, including things related to like either land ownership, uh, community-based uh, conservation, and also of course, training and capacity building. We've been trying to work more and more with universities and offering uh, internships and fellowships to young students so that we can train them in, in some of these uh, uh, challenges. And this is just a list of words, a, a cloud of the different things that I that you guys put in your presentations and in your research interests, right? And so these three main topics, uh, you know, through the filter of the work that you're doing and through the filter of all these different uh, 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 patterns and processes that are affected, like uh, 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 land use change, biodiversity, genetics, uh, ecophysiology, zoonotic diseases, all these different things feed directly into into some of these. Um, this, these uh, challenges that we, that we face as, as, uh, as practitioners, right? Um, and so those are some of the big questions. And one question for skyline conservation, and this is, you know, I have to wear multiple hats here. And uh, as I was saying that I want a transplant because what I was telling you about is this, what, what we're uh, experiencing over here in Sonora and Arizona. But um, I, in the past, I've, I've been focusing on what are some of the species responses to climate change at really high elevations and how can we do some research that can help uh, inform restoration approaches and goals, but also conservation priorities. Where do we focus some of our efforts in the coming decades? And uh, about that, I'm going to tell you a short story of a climate induced reversal of tree growth patterns in a, in a tropical subalpine, in tropical subalpine pines down there close to Mexico City. Um, but before that, I, I just want to highlight that you know modeling and uh, and understanding of refugia because of climate change, what is going to happen in the next decades, has really advanced a lot and has been uh, uh, really productive in the in, in the past years, uh, using uh, using uh, remote based technologies and uh, like satellites and 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 uh, sophisticated modeling to understand where is it, how species are going to move, how are they going to respond, and you know what areas should become a priority. But there's been there's a, a lot more lacking on detecting and doing this kind of work on the on the ground, and um, in maps in the case of of sky islands in the case of mountains we've had this sort of like elevation centric view of true responses to climate change, in which we can have situations you know where the population sort of leans upward, and so you have uh, signs of increasing growth at higher elevations in the range of the population or where the population marches entirely at higher to, to a higher elevation, right? When you start seeing higher survival rates at higher elevations compared to the lower elevations. But then of course, you also can have the population crashing where just basically everything is bad and you know, every, anywhere in, in um, the elevation gradient. Um, however, shifting oak slope is, uh, is not easy at all um, because you can have uh, different outcomes. Like if the rate of change is too fast as it's happening in many some places, uh, then the species just won't be able to make it up, right? Um, the other uh, potential situation is when uh, uh, there are mountaintop extinctions, for example, there's just not enough space to keep moving upward and it becomes a dead end. Uh, and then the other possibility is, can be when you have a, 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 a montane species that is sort of chasing over the subalpine species, right? The, of the, the ones that are moving up and then just outcompeting them in, in their own uh, grounds. So um, as opposed to this more elevation centric view of species responses to climate change in sky islands, um, I've been interested in how habitat heterogeneity, mostly uh, you know, the, defined by, by topography, can uh, help us understand how species will respond in more like in, in situ refugia um, uh, type of situations. Because you know, if moving into the future, like hundreds of years from now, if, when once things uh, are not as bad, hopefully, as, as they uh, seem to be right now. These, these are the places that perhaps will grant long-term resilience um, um, abilities to, to our sky islands. Um, so to study, to do this, I, I uh, started this project uh, some years ago in central Mexico, uh, in the East Tosiwato volcanoes. And our hypothesis were that with the warming, um, north-facing slopes, uh, which uh, will probably respond more to being more cold, limited by cold in terms of growth. Trees on north facing slopes um, would respond differently than uh, moisture limited south facing slope trees. Um, the idea, so we, we use tree core samples. Uh, we sample trees around, uh, along the uh, western slopes of the, of the uh, Estacihuatl volcano. 
um, on southern and north facing slopes along the, along the canyons. And uh, the hypothesis, the main idea was that um, in, in, in north facing slopes, we should see that would typically more cold limited, um, we should see some uh, enhanced tree growth uh, promote or uh, tree growth promotion. And on south uh, facing slopes, we should uh, ideally see a, a decline of, uh, of uh, in growth because of moisture limitation. Um, so I'm going to go so to just quickly to some of the results that we that we found in in these forests. These are uh, uh, Harwegi pines at uh, above 3,500 uh, meters of elevation, uh, up to 4,000 meters, and um, and so this is this is how our growth curves of basal area increment uh, look over time. These are not extremely old trees, like some of the oldest may have. 150 years or so, but what you can see here is that there is a clear shift sometime in the 1940s, 1950s, where North Aspect start growing faster, um, uh, you know, out, out, outgrowing their counterparts on south facing slopes. Um, so we do see that that pattern that we were that we were expecting, um, and uh, turns out that this is this is more complicated than just uh, trees on different aspects growing more or less. Because the the that that change that reversal of growth patterns has been driven mostly by younger younger trees. So what you can see here is maximum age, for example, in the in in, in the in the x-axis, and you see how uh, the younger the tree is on a north-facing aspect, for example, the more likely it is that it's growing faster than its south-facing um, counterpart. Um, you know, uh, controlling for age. Um, and on the right, on the right hand, you can see uh, just some trees reaching higher, bigger diameters. This is, this is diameter of breast height at early ages on north facing aspects compared to those on south facing aspects, which used to do that back a hundred years ago or so. Um, we used to sort of try to parse out the, the signal of you know how was this related to climate. We used stable isotopes, uh, carbon isotopes. We also use oxygen isotopes and, and nitrogen isotopes, but I, I, I don't won't have time to, to talk about those. Uh, but so this is uh, uh, these are our, uh, the results of our carbon isotopes done on trees of different ages on both north and south. We we selected some of the most contrasting growth patterns, and uh, so what you see are uh, water use efficiency and um, ca values calculated in mature and young trees. Um, and the values are plotted in a log disk. You can see that thin line of triangles, of great triangles. That is a simulated baseline of, of constant um, uh, uh, in internal and external concentrations um, of, of, um, of CO2. Um, so what that is telling you basically is that there, there you see south facing aspects uh, seeing struggling more with uh, water use efficiency, having higher water use efficiency uh, during the same periods than, than their counterparts on north facing aspects. And um, the relationship of these two to climate uh, is that uh, growth, what we found is that um, using mixed modeling over the last uh, 50 years or so that uh, growth responds um, negatively to maximum annual temperatures in this is in south aspects as you, uh, only compared to north aspects, but it responds positively to, to, uh, to more precipitation in any given year. And water use efficiency has the opposite pattern, right? So a more water use efficiency uh, on, on hotter years for south facing aspects and lower water use efficiency when you have water and more precipitation in any given year too. Um, so we do see a reversal of tree growth between slope aspects that we were expecting. Uh, it, it, we, we, we think that these, these south facing topographies are becoming more water limited and that perhaps north aspects are benefiting uh, uh, of a synergy of warming and, and, and enough soil moisture. And uh, the question that we are posing with this and that, that would be relevant for managing decisions would be whether these north aspects are actually becoming now a like local refugia in these mountains. Uh, I went for some seconds above my time. I'm so sorry about that, but uh, that's, that's it. Thank you very much. And now, Switching to my role of uh, another to different hat, um, I want to present Erica Johnson, uh, who is a PhD student at the City College University of New York, uh, and she, Erica, has a, a interest and a lot of experience working with uh, global environmental change and how that affects uh, uh, biotic interactions that um, have influence on uh, diseases and 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 uh, potentially human health too. Um, so. Um, welcome, Erica. Thanks so much. 
and I'll leave it to you now. All right. Thank you for that introduction. Um, so today I'm going to be talking a little bit about my PhD research in the Anderson lab. Basically, I'm trying to combine species distribution modeling with machine learning to create predictive vegetation maps. So land use change and land cover change are major drivers of biodiversity loss and have the potential to alter ecosystem functions and services with potential impacts on human health and well-being. And you can think of this as, for example, access to resources such as food or timber or water quality, all the way to zoonotic disease spillover. So there's a need for accurate estimates of current and future land cover to be able to design effective land use and conservation policies. Two common approaches to land cover classification mapping is um, land cover classification maps and species distribution modeling. So the first uh, uses remotely sensed imagery to classify it and then produce these land cover maps. This, um, these are, however, labor intensive and are typically static. And although this is rapidly changing with the advent of the technology, but more importantly, they lack predictive ability, meaning that you can't transfer them to different areas or different time periods. Species distribution modeling, on the other hand, predicts habitat suitability by linking known occurrences of a species with its environmental requirements, and these can be projected in space and time. Um, importantly, however, is that these typically ignore biotic interactions, and when we're building these uh, land cover maps, they are categorical, so we don't typically think of two land cover types being in the same place at the same time. So somehow we need to account for that. Therefore, I decided to focus on assessing the utility of coupling these species distribution models with classification analyses using machine learning and remotely sensed data for predictive vegetation mapping. And the system I focused on is the Sierra Madre Oriental, and I chose these three different vegetation types uh, to, to test these on. So in the Sierra Madre, we have a very uh, naturally fragmented system where in the peaks of these mountains, we have pine oak and cloud forest, and they're separated by a low-lying xeric vegetation like the submontane scrubland. Now, the forests in these systems are threatened by anthropogenic activities such as agriculture and mining and timber extraction. Uh, furthermore, all three of these vegetation types, as we can see here, really differ in their physiognomy, in the species composition, and their environmental requirements. So to do this, I first built um, my species distribution models for each one of my vegetation types using points extracted from existing land cover polygons and bioclimatic and soil variables. Then to define boundaries where these predictions would overlap, I used three different types of classification analyses. The first one is winter by cell, and then I use two support vector machines, one using spatial data and one using spatial environmental data. And the last thing I did was to account for these anthropogenic effects by using a tree cover mask using the MODIS vegetation continuous field to remove areas that might have been affected by human activities. So just to go a little more in detail about my methods, um, for my species distribution models, I focus in the Carso Huasteco and then I use the INEGI. INEGI is the National Institute of Statistics and Geography of Mexico, for those who are unfamiliar with it. Um, their land cover and land use polygons created points in those polygons. And then I removed the points using the MODIS vegetation continuous field data that would be in areas that had a tree cover that was inconsistent with what I would expect for that vegetation type. So for example, if I had a point in cloud forest that had a tree cover that was very low, this is unrealistic, or I would consider it not to be a, a cloud forest, and I would remove that point. My predictor variables were the CHELSA, all 19 biochromatic variables, and INEHI soil type. And then with these inputs, I built maxent models using a spatial block partition. This I did because I was interested in the transferability of these models. And then I used model tuning to find the parameters that would generate the best models possible. So this is where things get a little complicated, so bear with me. These are my classification analyses. So the first one, the winner by cell, is very simple. I just compared the raster predictions generated by my distribution models at a pixel by pixel level. So whichever vegetation type had a higher value at that pixel will get assigned the pixel in the end. For example, if we see right here, uh, between these two layers, I have a 0.4 prediction suitability value versus a 0.2 and the blue category takes the win for that pixel. 
Now, my, my support vector machines, these are different. These are machine learning classifiers that are commonly used to, find, um, to define classes, actually. And the way it does this is by drawing infinite hyperplanes and finding the one that maximizes the distance between my classes. And my classes are defined by multiple inputs. So my spatial SVM or support vector machine considered only the spatial coordinates of my occurrences as inputs. Whereas my spatial environmental SDM, um, SDM sorry, used the spatial coordinates and the predicted suitability values from my species distribution models as inputs. Sorry. And the last thing I did was then with those coupled models, I masked them with my forest cover data from my mode of vegetation continuous fields with thresholds that were in accordance to what I would expect for each vegetation type. So I would go from a model that was like this to something that looks more like that. And this was to account for potential anthropogenic activity. So as I expected, uh, whenever I consider these potential interactions with my classification layers, I, I reduced the distribution of the suitable habitat quite a bit for all three classifiers. However, how they changed that distribution did vary depending on the classifier used. So when I put all three vegetation types together, we can see this. Um, broadly, we're talking about patterns that look very similar with, for, for example, my cloud forest generally predicted in the southeast and my scrublands um, in the northwest. However, there were key things that were different, especially with regard to the SVMs versus the winter by cell. And one of the main differences was that the, both SVM models were able to correctly predict these small isolated patches of pine oak forest, as well as these tracts of low suitability pine forest um, in the eastern flanks of my distribution. Another thing that's uh, relevant to mention is if we notice the suitability values of the winter by cell, they tend to be inflated, and this is because of the nature of the classifier. So this is not necessarily because it actually is where the vegetation is, but because the way I define the classifier as selecting the highest value, it's gonna give me inflated models of, for, of habitat suitability for each vegetation type. Now, same as um, we were observing before, the amount of suitable area vary significantly depending on the classifier that I selected. And for example, for the cloud forest, the winter by cell gave me the highest predicted area for suitable area. And this was reduced with uh, both SVM approaches. And we observe as, uh, an opposite pattern for the pine oak. So uh, winter by cell actually gave me the lowest predicted suitable area, whereas the spatial environmental SVM gave me the highest. And this is likely because um, these two vegetation types are quote unquote more in competition with, e with each other under these classifiers because their environmental requirements are more similar and they're also distributed at more similar um, altitudes and their distribution is a little more similar. So whatever is given to one vegetation type in one model or one classifier is attributed to the other in accordance. Um, and the last thing I wanted to point out is also because we do have these big differences in, um, in the predicted suitable area, depending on our classifier, when we account for potential impact of deforestation or just land use change by um, using that forest cover map, we're gonna get different estimates of area loss as well. And this has potential implications when we're actually trying to um, anticipate what is the risk of an ecosystem or what is um, the effect of these anthropogenic activities in the present and in the future and, you know, basically that depending you know, the classifier or how we account for these interactions matters if we want to have these accurate estimates of how much risk our ecosystem is at. So future directions for this research include validating these coupled DNM classifier models with um, independent occurrence data. Uh, a second step would be to test the predictive ability of these models by transferring them to an other area where all of these vegetation types exist. And if that works out, then it would be interesting to explore the applications of transferring these models in time, so like to different climate change scenarios. Lastly, what I would like to do is estimate the impact of including these biotic interactors and anthropogenic pressures on habitat suitability values, meaning 
after we, we take away these areas where there's interactions and take away the areas where humans might be affecting the environment, are we losing high quality or like high suitability areas? Or is it just low suitability areas that are being removed? And what are the implications for conservation? So with that, I'd like to thank you guys for listening to me, first of all, and then everybody who has helped me along the way, as well as the grants that have been supporting this research. Thank you. Thank you very much, Erika. That is super, super interesting and, uh, and really well presented. Thank you. Um, I want to introduce you to Robbie Borger, which I'm uh, really happy to do because he was the one reaching out and inviting me here. Uh, Robbie is a Bridging Biodiversity and Conservation Science Postdoctoral Fellow at the U of A. Uh, and in the fall 2021, he will be starting as Assistant Professor of University of Kentucky. So congratulations, Robbie. He is a macroecologist and combines theory and data from field studies to large data set to try to understand general rules of underlying biodiversity and use those rules to um, address practical issues in, in global change, uh, conservation, and human ecology. Robbie, uh, welcome and uh, all yours. Okay, great. Um, thanks for that uh, introduction, Paulo, and thanks for everyone for joining us. Um, as Paulo said, I'm currently a postdoc at the University of Arizona in the BBCS program, um, and I'm, I, I'm actually currently visiting uh, Lexington, Kentucky, where I will be starting a faculty position in the fall. Um, so I think this is, the, this is the view from the Catalina Mountains, um, looking south to the uh, Santa Rita Mountains um, in Southern Arizona. Tucson is in the, um, the uh, low-lying area below here. And I think that this view is certainly sort of a uh, exemplar of the Skyland, you know, sort of concept. Um, these are mountain, forested mountaintops uh, that sort of rise up from um, desert ecosystems below. So one of the things that I'm going to be presenting is sort of a, <clears throat> um, a theoretical framework from island biogeography theory, uh, some new extensions um, that we think could be useful for uh, applied science and conservation and thinking about climate change. Um, and this all sort of centers around uh, island biogeography theory. So the previous slide was a view from here, the Catalina Mountains, just north of Tucson looking south. Um, and you can see this is the uh, borderlands region, Arizona, New Mexico, Chihuahua, and Sonora. Um, several dozen uh, island, sky island sis, uh, mountain systems um, in this region, you can see Border to in the south by the Sierra Madres from uh, uh, that you can see on the right here um, that extend um, uh, throughout uh, sort of the western part of the Sierra Madre Occidental, the western part of um, of Mexico. This is the Madrian Archipelago that we often think of here in the in the borderlands. Um, the Sierra Madre Oriental, where Erica was talking about in some of our field work, is involved with the NSF grant. Uh, northern extensions include West Texas, some of the mountains like the Chisos Mountains, um, the Guadalupe and uh, Davis Mountains in Texas. In some case, in some uh, uh, characterization more similar to the Oriental than the Occidental um, in Southern Arizona and Southwestern um, uh, New Mexico. And also I should point out bordering to the North, which also makes this such an interesting place is the Colorado Plateau. Um, so this is the Mogollon Rim, uh, Silver City. So this is the Gila Wilderness uh, area here. These ecosystems, high elevation, much more sort of uh, characteristic of, of Rocky Mountain fauna, uh, not exclusively, but this is sort of interesting because the skyline systems here are at this uh, intersection between these major mountain ranges, as well as the Sonoran Desert to the west and the Chihuahuan Desert to the, um, to the east. Thinking about skyline systems is nothing new. This is really foundational to biogeography and macroecology, starting with MacArthur Wilson, where they presented this very simple model of how to predict the numbers on an island. Um, two processes, uh, the migration rate um, and the extinction uh, rate on this island. So migration, a, a uh, function of the distance of the island from the source. So uh, islands that are much closer um, have higher speed, higher immigration rates than far islands. Extinction being driven by um, the size of the island. So small islands having higher extinction um, rates than large islands. So 
Large islands that are close would be predicted to have high species richness, small islands that are far low species richness. Um, and we can sort of think about this very simple equation. The biodiversity on a given island uh, is equal to those that colonize minus extinction. Assuming no evolution, we can add an additional term of speciation if we want to. And this is all, uh, you know, um, the Song of the Dodo, I think, really covers a lot of this uh, literature um, and its relevance to modern conservation issues. So one of the things that classical biogeography theory and MacArthur Wilson really thought about these dynamic immigration and extinction um, processes on static islands. And one of the things that we become really interested in is that these islands themselves actually change through time. Um, and that's the focus of this paper by Rob Anderson um, that I collaborated with Rob Anderson, Megan Balk, and Trevor Fristo. And uh, one of the things that we see is that, especially you know, if you think about my, mountain systems in the northern, uh, uh, or uh, sort of in North America, these are dynamic systems in that they're influenced by glacial events uh, periodically. Um, certainly throughout the late um, Pleistocene, these glacial events uh, occur on timescales of ten, tens of thousands of years. So relatively quick timescales in um, comparison to sort of deep evolutionary and geological time. And what we you know, generally understand is that you know, glaciers were not as far south as the Madrian um, archipelago, uh, at least during the last glacial maximum, but boreal forests that were much further north were certainly pushed down, okay? Um, and so you can see this graphic illustration here shows if we start at T1, this is at a time when um, glaciations uh, further south, the area of the island is much larger and its connectivity to the source is also greater. If we go through time from T1 to T3, this is a shrinking phase um, where both connectivity and area decrease and we're left with really small uh, island uh, mountaintop patches at the tops of these islands, okay? And again, because these cycles do occur on um, uh, these glacial cycles, um, you know, we can think about these repeated events in influencing the biota of these mountaintop systems. So what we're interested in is how can we begin to think about, okay, these islands are dynamic. Um, how can we also think about to, how, how do we include traits in understanding uh, the consequences for this, this dynamic island system um, for biodiversity? And so I'll walk through two uh, examples of how we do this at the population level, um, as well as the community level um, to think about sort of the candidate uh, species pool for community assembly on these mountaintop islands. At the population level, um, we're thinking about traits that influence colonization. So what influences the habitat suitability uh, for a species and the intervening matrix between the island and the source. And these are often related to things like dispersal, physiological tolerance, certainly if you have, um, uh, you know, an amphibian and uh, uh, an oceanic island certainly has a physiological barrier there to um, dispersing. On the flip side, and these two processes actually switch in their importance as we go through these cycles that I'll, I'll explain that a bit more. On the extinction side, we're really thinking about the metabolic traits that are linked to the area required to sustain a population. Okay, so body size, trophic level, um, physiology, whether you're an endotherm or an ectotherm, these are characteristics that influence the uh, the minimal viable area to sustain a population. And so let's just walk through an example. Um, if we have a hypothetical mouse that lives in this is the source area here, um, four different islands, A through D. Uh, and at this point in time, we can see that there's a barrier to colonizing D for this species, um, but not A, B, and C. And so if we move one time step forward, or excuse me, this is the first time step, but we do have colonization to these three islands um, where there is a currently suitable habitat in the inter intervening matrix. We can go to the next time step. So this is a drying phase. This is where the islands are shrinking, habitats sort of being concentrated more at the tops of these mountains. And what we see is that, okay, uh, there's suitable habitat in all four of these islands, um, mountaintops, um, but the species is only present on B and C we lose the population, becomes extirpated on island A, 
due to the fact that the island area has now shrunk below this minimum um, threshold. Okay, um, and so we can move to another, you know, even further drying. Again, island C is now too small to maintain that population, a local extirpation. And here we are back at the original um, sort of uh, state where, uh, again, um, the population is now only persisting on island B, despite the fact that we have suitable habitat and three of the islands actually have large enough areas to sustain the population. So the importance of the history of the system um, is, is crucial here. And I'll just point this out that in T4 and T2, we have a similar system state, okay? The islands are exactly the same area, connectivity is exactly the same, but yet we have different uh, distributions of the populations on these different islands. And that is because of the history in the system, um, something that we think of as hysteresis, not only the system state, but the historical contingency and the trajectory in the cycle is important to understand um, present distributions on these mountaintops. We can do this at the community level. Again, for, you know, we have uh, five different um, hypothetical mice with uh, different um, area requirements and connectivity, okay? And if we walk through this cycle again, going from T1, high connectivity, large area, uh, and we go through this um, uh, drying phase where, I, where these systems are isolated and, and being constricted, so the extinction process is, is, uh, is the um, driving force here. And going from T1 to T2, you see that we lose a species that has the highest area requirements. Going from T2 to T3, again, shrinking even further, we lose a species uh, with this, the two species with the second highest requirements. If we were to go through uh, a glacial cycle and we actually came back to um, the opposite way where we're expanding in this expanding phase, um, we see that we pick up not, this, not the, uh, the two intermediate species, but the largest one because connectivity is now the most important force. Um, and then back at T5, uh, we have the original um, species pool that we started with. And again, what's interesting about this is when we walk through this logic, we see this sort of hysteresis in the system where T2 and T4, the same environmental states, but different community composition because um, what's important is the historical contingency, understanding uh, which phase and which trajectory we are, we are in in this cycle um, is important in understanding the potential community composition. So again, this is what we call hysteresis in the system. Um, not only the current system state, but the, the history is important. So I hope you're asking, you know, okay, this is, you know, Trevor's an excellent artist. He, paint, he, uh, he draws these beautiful, um, images, maybe we're sort of, you know, touching on some intuition from sort of biology and natural history, but how are we really going to do this? Um, and this is what we're, where we're currently at and, and where we would, you know, love feedback here. How do we determine the constraints on populations um, through allometric scaling? I'm just showing here an example of density scaling with size in mammals. What we know is that bigger organisms occur at lower densities. Uh, they also have much slower um, reproductive rates and generation times. And so we can begin to use allometric scaling to understand the population size, abundance, and, and, uh, and turnover of populations um, on these island systems. And we're coupling that with species distribution modeling with uh, Erica just presented a bit on. Um, this is a, an example that um, Gonzalo Pena has uh, done for our system in the Sierra Madre Oriental. But um, with di distribution modeling, we can both understand the distribution of the species in the present, but also do uh, these back um, projections to understand wh what species had connectivity in the past. So whether or not a species was able to colonize an island based on its past suitability, okay? And for both of these, you know, field work and museum collections are absolutely essential to being um, able to both derive uh, accurate allometric scaling approaches as well as distribution models. So this approach does have some limitations um, and assumptions that we're dealing with and maybe, you know, sort of identifying them is an important step in understanding when they're relevant and also how to include them. So we're not including sto stochastic events. Um, time lags seem to be really important. There is a possibility of, you know, you, you document a species present on an island but yet it's sort of doomed to extinction in the sense that the, the area 
is already reduced um, below its sort of minimum threshold to be to sustain a population. So we can think about these as sort of extinction debts. We can also think about colonization credits where there's both suitable, suitable habitat and large enough areas for a particular species to, um, to migrate to a specific island, but yet it hasn't actually showed up there yet. And this can be really important in thinking about future uh, uh, you know, climate change and the, and the movement migrations of species to new locations. No biotic interactions, um, certainly this could be important and especially non-native species that have been introduced to some of these systems. And we're also thinking about no evolution. When we do, you know, we construct a distribution model based on the present, we project it into the past and into the future, we're sort of thinking that, you know, that, that these are conserved. Um, okay, so that's sort of the, the approach. And I'll just end with a couple of examples from uh, the Borderlands region in terms of extinction, um, Forecast. This is a, 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 a nice chapter by John Kaprowski and Melissa Merrick and others, uh, where on the left here, um, the dark areas are pine oak woodlands. Uh, and on the right here, as you can see, this is a projection to 2100, um, where you can see the shrinking of these, uh, this habitat, the pine oak um, forest in the skylands in southern Arizona. And so these have implications. And one of the the numbers that they came up in this study were 15 to 20 percent of the reptiles and mammals are at risk of climate change. Again, these are uh, you know non-volant species. These are um, very restricted in their dispersal capacities. But in contrast, um, you know some of my favorite birds in the Southwest: red-faced warbler and ocotero. Uh, these are species of Majorian origin that presumably have very recently colonized the Scott Islands and not only colonized the the Skylands and the Borderlands, but have already um, colonized the uh, parts of the Colorado Plateau even further north. Okay, and so um, so it's interesting to think the Sky Islands themselves are probably shrinking due to um, climate change, but yet the dispersal capacity is really important. So I think it's important to think about the cross taxa comparisons that we can uh, incorporate into this kind of research. So thanks for your time. Um, I'd like to just acknowledge everyone that's been involved and uh, has helped in thinking about this kind of um, study. AIR staff has been amazing in terms of the logistics for this uh, webinar series. And I will just leave you with uh, this beautiful um, flyer that Maya Stahl uh, drew up for this event. So thanks for your time. Thank you, Robbie. That was really good. Um, so, uh, we are moving into the Q&A session. And so, uh, well, Laurie was just helping us here. Please, if you have any questions, you can uh, submit it through the chat. Um, and I am happy to uh, read them or and translate them if that's necessary. I think there's a question from Jason Mullaney. Yeah, I, my chat, I, my, my, my screen is a bit it's frozen. Robbie, do you mind? Sure, yeah. Um, so Jason asks, great advancement of the science. How do you envision integrating rapid evolutionary change adaptation plus phylogenetic or cryptic variation into CDIB, especially for deeper time scaling such as glacial into glacial cycling? Or addressing the assumption of species populations as monolithic through time? Um, I think, yeah, great question, Jason. I think that uh, you know, these are the kinds of questions where when we're trying to bridge theory with uh, empirics, um, and I, I think, and hopefully this will be a, a good discussion question, is the incorporation of, um, of genetic approaches, I think, very much can complement, you know, the, the framework that we have through the CDEB model in terms of understanding the isolation and connectivity of these populations. So could potentially, you know, highlight regions of cryptic species or understanding populations that are, um, you know, that have been uh, separated for um, substantial time. So that is a major part, and I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, thinking about how to connect uh, molecular tools, phylogenetic approaches, and, and population genetic approaches to understanding uh, these dynamic systems. Yeah, so this is a question for, I guess, everyone using um, sort of uh, SDMs here. So. Um, I, from, so my experience, I've used a lot of SDMs in the fossil record. Um, and one of the issues that I've come up with is that, um, 
you know, especially given dispersal limited taxa that your SDM at any one given time period might not fully capture the, the sort of full extent of the species, say fundamental niche that would be super relevant for projecting um, in the past. So I've been using sort of uh, like a multi-temporal extent sort of that David Nogas Bravo at, at Copenhagen first uh, developed, but I'm sort of curious in how you guys, how you guys are all um, going about this, you know, how confident are you that you're actually capturing the sort of full extent of your species distributions here, or niche at least that you can then project elsewhere? So I don't know if Rob or maybe Gonzalo wants to take this, but um, so Gonzalo is one of the people in our lab and he's currently working on something very similar to what you're saying, just trying to do some temporal matching um, with the occurrences and the environmental data to then be able to improve um, the past predictions. And I think he's here, so he can speak to that himself if he wants to. So yes, no, the thing is like, let's be honest, I don't know, I don't know this approach that they're using in Copenhagen, but yes, it's the, it's the way to go is like, technically there is a lot of information, a lot of the occurrences that we have. And uh, yes, technically you have like, when you match the information of the occurrences of the particular climate uh, in where you observe of you this observation, so technically you you will have a more accurate uh, estimation of what will be like the realized niche of your species. And technically you can do the same thing if you go and you have the climate of your fossil, but but the problem is the data. I think that there is a big limitation of the environmental data to get like go and get this very particular uh, information of the climate on when the fossil occur. And also it's like there is a lot of bias uh, and where the fossil was taken because yes we cannot get that very specific date of when this fossil uh, uh, occurred or happened but yes i think that yeah uh, right now there is a lot of things that is going on in in particular with this kind of questions but yes i think that yeah it's something that is in development so we will see what happens uh, with this kind of question yeah thanks gonzalo um, there's another question to Robby. Uh, have you thought about how to apply your approach to plants? It is not clear to me how the area available would affect plant species. That is, uh, trees and shrubs seem to be able to survive in relatively small populations despite being large individuals. Uh, example, several pines, junipers, berberries with populations of only hundreds of hens. That's, uh, yeah, pretty cool. interesting. Yeah, very, ex uh, very excellent question. Alicia, um, and to some degree, maybe I'll default to Brian, our, our resident plant allometry expert. But um, I guess one thing to, to think about is, you know, we're really trying to think about what's the minimum area to sustain an isolated population, not just individuals. Um, and maybe, yeah, you know, in some of these montane systems, we do see, you know, just a few individuals that can, uh, especially, you know, long-lived plants that can just persist for, uh, for a really long time. Um, but maybe that's just a very long extinction debt, you know, that these, that population, if it's not... Uh, I'm not sure, because okay. if, if they sit there for long enough, maybe there is another cycle where they can extend. And this seems to be what's going on with several of these species, at least in, in the Mexican Sky Islands. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. They, they used, yeah, if there were no cycles, I, I think you would be right, but because better times will come, then they just huh. wait there. <laughs> and I think uh, Paulo's um, data kind of shows that too. Like maybe they move to one side of the mountain and sit there. Right. Oh, I'm not, not sure. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, and, and yeah, sort of preserving even those really small relic populations for their sort of uh, evolutionary potential in the future, I guess, could be really important too, even if they're not. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that's where the allometries can sort of provide some real insights into really telling us what at least the constraints are on the generation time, the population turnover, et cetera. Um, to sort of get a, at least a first, um, you know, idea of what the timescales that are relevant for these small um, populations. Um, thank you, Robbie. So there are 
there, so there's a question for me, but I think so that we can stay, I, I can get back to that. And as uh, Kimberly could say, in building on Alicia's plan questions about how my plant dispersal be affected by the dispersal capabilities of the animals that spread seeds through their various activities. So that just to stay on track with the previous. Let's see, I see one question um, from me from Rebecca. Uh, so oh yeah, sorry, I skipped that, yeah. That's okay. Um, from an Alice undergrad, could you expand a bit more on how you integrate empirical field work and museum collections into your species distribution models? What sort of data are you collecting from the field and at what scale? Um, since Rob, Robert Gonzalo, do you wanna comment specifically about some of the idea or some of the field approaches uh, in our current study? Sure. Um... I, I mean, all of the data we're using come from natural history museums because these are rodents and marsupials um, that you really can't identify uh, by observing them. Um, and the, the field work in our project is to determine the species list uh, of individual islands uh, because we're going to be making models um, based on existing occurrence records and then making predictions of um, what we expect on the, of the communities on uh, particular islands. And then our field work will be to fill the gaps uh, in existing knowledge to determine what that list of species is and see if it matches our predictions. Great, thank you. Um, we're almost at time. Um, I just, there was that uh, quick question for me about the, uh, wondering how much the age related differences you found in tree growth, uh, what is which is seen are due to age, uh, versus more recent climate change. And if we were able to tease apart that with the data set. Um, just very briefly, the, so the, the main difference that we saw were between uh, trees of the same ages, right? So, which we didn't see when they were younger a hundred years ago. So that was the, the, the most interesting thing for us was that we saw the, the diversion or the change in patterns because of, uh, or controlling for, for age differences between, between the populations of, of, of on both sides. Um, and the perspective on how long those neurotrophies love might remain refugia, I don't know, Alicia was saying, you know, she, uh, she probably knows more much about that than I do. But um, with the current rate of change, those areas, they're, we're not in, in, uh, in a particularly high latitude in terms of like, like, like over here in Sonora, Arizona. So um, uh, when, I truly don't know how much the effect of aspect, um, you know, would, would remain important during the following decades. Um, but the, those trees certainly seem to be doing fine on, on North Faces. Um, so it's 1210, and uh, there are a few more questions there. Uh, well, there's a paper, there's someone just a, some, a comment. So I think if everyone's all right with it, we uh, need to move to breakout sessions. So now we have uh, about 15 minutes or so to, um, to uh, do some reporting, and I would like to. Uh, encourage you know whoever was your uh, note taker or moderator in your own group to uh, provide a quick summary of what your main points were and then maybe we can have a little bit of a discussion around those and then we'll have some time for the key takeaways from these meetings um entonces si para la gente en los que quieran en español también eh, tenemos ahí un Un, unos minutos para poder comunicar los puntos principales de lo que discutimos, quien sea que se anime de, del, del grupo donde participaron. Are we going in any particular order? Uh, that's a good three? point. That, that's my responsibility. So um, let's see, why don't we start with uh, group one, which, uh, and you go in order, and that was uh, Robbie in charge, but I don't know if someone else wants to jump in. Okay, um, I can just give a quick summary of some of the things that we talked about. Uh, we talked about, you know, how do you incorporate uncertainty in these kinds of projections? Um, and some of the things that we talked about was related to, you know, the curation of the biodiversity data. So like the data that we actually input into SDMs or the data that we use for allometries, um, you know, there's certainly a uh, need to curate those data. Um, we also talked about intraspecific specific variation and the utility in that. And I'll just briefly say, you know, like, Island biogeography in the traditional sense has looked at this island, um, you know, size rule where big, you know, like big mammals become smaller and small mammals become larger. And, you know, do we see those on these mountaintop 
island, you know? So uh, the interest specific variation and trait distribution, just thinking about body size distributions could be really interesting. Um, uh, space time trade offs, something that we always really think about. Um, and maybe the hysteresis problem sort of provides some insights into that. And the last thing we brought up was sort of like assistant migration. If we sort of, uh, you know, is that a conservation strategy? Although, um, you know, I think the practitioners would be interesting to hear their ideas and uh, on that. So I think that was mostly, oh, and also including SDMs with growth rates as well as demographic rates. Mm -hmm. So sort of having, um, you know, I think that that's certainly a, pro a ripe area and also the complementary uh, molecular techniques and phylogenetics and pop gen um, to the biogeographic approaches. So I think that was mostly it. Great, thanks Robbie. Uh, from group two, uh, Brooks Coley. Hope I pronounced yeah, it correctly. Uh, yeah, Coley, that's all right. Coley, uh, sorry about that. No, that's, uh, I think I, I think I just pronounced it wrong, my family. Anyway, um, yeah, we think our, our group, um, I think there were a lot of uh, similarities uh, based on what Robbie said with group one. Um, kind of just this basic idea that uh, we just really need a lot more data about the species. So sort of their natural histories, you know, what are their real limitations? Um, what are their habitat? Uh, requirements, you know, the things that are kind of at the core of, of these predictions. Um, but it, it was, you know, it's encouraging to hear that the this project uh, we're hearing a lot about sort of combines field work with this more conceptual development. So that's a real uh, strength, we thought. Um, but there's, and there's also some exciting ways um, to help, to hopefully um, help fill some of these um, just like basic occurrence data gaps. So like really exciting things like uh, environmental DNA sampling. Um, you know, we talked about these really exciting applications where you can just like scoop up some soil or even sample air and get potentially DNA samples. Um, so, you know, especially in really hard to, to get to locations, things like that. Um, and then also other existing tools that might help address some of the limitations that Robbie was talking about earlier. Um, about, you know, maybe stochasticity or biotic interactions. So like, a, you know, e SDMs that are out there that do account for some of those types of things or are starting to integrate um, some more of those uh, kind of drivers a bit more, um, as well as things like uh, kind of advanced occupancy modeling to help address the possibility of, um, you know, basically detection biases in some of these islands, that sort of thing. Things, things that can help potentially help ease some of these kind of just constant data, data um, availability issues. So that's what we spent, I think, most of our time talking about. Great. Thank you, Brooks. Um, uh, Brian with group three, or someone from the group? Yes, here we go. Here, I'll just share my screen. Um, okay, so we were tasked with the question of how can we leverage existing tools from existing disciplines to further Sky Island biodiversity research and conservation? And so um, kind of chronicling then the, the discussions, but we kind of quickly focused on um, building on what Robbie presented that I think there's still a need to leverage um, what, we, what we know about generalities associated with macroecology and biogeography. In particular, can we use some of the equations um, that's coming out of macroecology, in particular from scaling theory, that's linking um, key traits of organisms, such as body size in particular, and how body size influences not only population density, but maximum population density, minimum population density, as well as life history attributes, um, mean generation time, dispersal ability, as well as geographic range size, minimum population size, and so on. So I think that's a pretty rich kind of fertile ground to begin to kind of explore a little bit more, especially within the context of specific questions associated with biodiversity on Sky Islands and how Sky Islands respond then to changing climates and variability in climates. Um, very quickly, we also kind of focused on, well, you know, geez, you know, we can, we can focus on all these, these great tools and things that are needed, but in general, we also need to better communicate with governments because uh, if, if we don't communicate the necessity 
of, um, kind of not only preservation of biodiversity, but the imminent um, kind of results of not only human land use, but also climate change on biodiversity, much of what we study is for naught, right? So, so we need to also uh, keep that kind of first and foremost uh, in terms of our communications. Um, we also talked um, quite a bit about uh, figuring out various uh, genomic tools um, that we could uh, potentially leverage and kind of synthesize then between um, several of our different approaches. In particular, I think um, there's, there's, there's quite a bit that could be done in terms of understanding not only what generates genetic variability within and between populations, um, but also what maintains that. Um, and there was really fun discussion about things like um, uh, minimum population sizes, but as well as effective population sizes. Right, so effective population size is is effectively given the amount of genetic variability then that's there. How many you know individuals then would be kind of underlying that? And so, um, concepts of effective population size from genetics as well as what we know of is uh, from the scaling of population density. What are the linkages then between that so that we can begin to have a lot of things more robust understanding of the origin and maintenance then of genetic variability because genetic variability is ultimately what's gonna potentially save or at least limit um, uh, extinction risks um, within Sky Islands. Um, we also discussed uh, this focus on concepts uh, and methods to better link kind of bioge uh, biogeography, informatics, genomics, phylogenetics, and so on. Um, and we kind of circled around this concept uh, coming out of um, biogeography, uh, in particular back to E.O. Wilson, this concept of taxon cycles which is kind of a repeatable pattern that's observed mainly on oceanic islands, but could very well be a general property of islands in terms of species replacements, moreover at this kind of bridge between ecological and evolutionary time. And if concepts such as taxon cycles, that is the orderly replacement and predictability ultimately of colonization, um, boom and bust cycles of abundance as well as extinction, you know, can we learn more um, about um, you know, uh, kind of minimizing extinction risks from kind of these general biogeographic uh, patterns associated with taxon cycles? Right? And so that was kind of you know, an idea that we spent actually quite a bit uh, of time kind of thinking about. Um, there was also this important point that in order to kind of facilitate um, kind of not only the sharing of methodology and information, um, there, there's an urgent need to actually facilitate um, sharing of people, specimens, and ideas across borders, right? And so many of us often wait for specimens to be delivered from one side of the border to another. We often have to uh, wait in terms of uh, uh, students then that can be kind of shared then between institutions and in different countries. And so there was a real kind of understanding that uh, there's an urgent need actually to help facilitate kind of the sharing of um, data, ideas, specimens, and so on. So even in terms of open science, Right, so there are certain places, uh, geographic locations that are kind of doing more open science and that may not necessarily be uh, the emphasis in other locations, right? And so kind of coming up with a com common uh, kind of culture in terms of data sharing, openness of workflows and so on. Thanks, um, Brian. Yep, that's it. Thanks, thanks very much. Um, all right, so let's go with uh, group four, Dave Richards. Uh, just a reminder, let's try to keep it you know, as, as brief as possible so that everyone can, can uh, jump in here. Thank you. Yeah, I put uh, our group and our three takeaway points in the chat. I'll just go over them very quickly. Uh, we identified lots of gaps and those came up from three different perspectives. One was museum collections, different types of data gaps there, uh, gap, in trying to bridge US and Mexico data sets was another key one. And then gaps in um, experiments that determine uh, tolerance levels of different species. And expanding on that a little bit, we need tolerances uh, to, we need to understand the tolerances to abiotic filtering events to get the resilience levels and to know the variation in those tolerance levels better. Uh, both and and uh, that includes uh, uh, you know regional variation among region variation genotypic variation whatnot um, uh, within species uh, and then third with more integrated data sets we need a community standard for how to deal with data and how to manage it and that's our those are our three take takeaways thank you Dave um, Sandra here oops um, 
to five? So I would say that our group was really focused on uh, data, the need for different sorts of data to support and validate models. Um, we talked about museum specimens and how these need greater investment um, in terms of what um, uh, past records, but also in tracking change um, to understand how population and genetics are changing through a PETIS sampling as environments change. Um, one thing that was um, emphasized was the importance of biotic interactions and need to incorporate these. Um, for example, um, parasite disease ecology. Um, we also uh, talked about the benefits of long-term ecological research to uh, establish baselines and, um, and, and understand uh, changes going forward. Um, the uh, need for more field-based monitoring and um, also uh, looking at different, uh, in terms of uh, modeling tree uh, species response, looking at different, um, different life stages in addition to adults. Um, and last, uh, thinking about disturbance, how do uh, processes like fire uh, affect seed dispersal and recruitment and so on. That's it. Thank you. Um, okay, so it, uh, group six, where I was, uh, we were in Spanish, eh, así que lo voy a decir en español y luego en inglés rápido. Brevemente, una de las cosas más importantes que platicamos sobre ranas en la Mata Atlántica, por ejemplo, eh, brachycephalas y quetzales en Guatemala, y cómo eh, una de las grandes faltantes que, eh, que, que tenemos es la capacidad de, de colectar datos en campo a pre una precisión que nos ayuden a validar muchas de las predicciones y los modelos. Por ejemplo, microsensores de temperatura y humedad que quisiéramos todos tener por todos lados, porque sería fundamental para investigación que tiene que ver con pisos altitudinales y con variabilidad topográfica. Y como no tener acceso a ese tipo de datos, pues limita mucho la investigación y por tanto la conservación. So we were talking mostly about how important it would be to have access in a lot of these our sky islands to um, field technology like microsensors for temperature and, and humidity that would really allow us to uh, do a lot of progress in terms of in both in research and conservation to feed uh, larger scale models and species distributions um, and that kind of stuff. So that's, I'm gonna, and so now Erica, please with group seven, um, thanks. Yeah, so um, I think a lot of what my group discussed was already touched upon. Um, the main thing was uh, the lack of genetic data and maybe how that, that can help, especially at the resolutions that are needed to understand these like demographic or um, evolutionary patterns of you know, migration, adaptation, et cetera. But one of the key things that did come up, um, I think because we had someone from CONAMP, uh, for those who are not familiar, that's the Commission for National Protected Areas in Mexico. And she brought up the point that there needs to be better communication between academics and government officials. Um, and that we need to establish better protocols to like have consistent monitoring in the long term of these biodiversity, um, not only increased communication, but just better monitoring and how to share this information between these two facets. Thank you, Erica. Um, uh, group eight with uh, Rob Anderson, please. Hi. Um, so we talked about a lot of things that could be uh, relevant to any aspect of uh, global change, and I'll go over some of that. Um, but also there are a couple things that are specific, um, well, particularly important in a fragmented landscape like this. Um, so one thought was simply necessary data and the idea of networks of researchers in order to um, promote data acquisition. Um, Another is, um, of course, a, a good tool is SDMs, and one check of that is genetic information to see if retrojected uh, SDMs indeed uh, predict uh, patterns of population genetics that are consistent with reconstructed um, refugia. And if that works, then more credence in believing the predictions into the future. Um, one thing that came over up, uh, several times was um, the importance of critical biotic interactions for the movement of species. Will they really track the changing climates? Um, and a lot of that can have to do with whether their pollinators are also moving, whether their um, critical uh, seed dispersers are also moving. 
Um, and this leads into information about phenology um, because maybe um, the right one is there, but it's not active at the right time. Um, phenology came up again, or physiological information uh, came up again as another way uh, to test um, whether the SDMs are working. Um, but then the other thing is um, the, um, the biotic interactions that may be affected, like the movement of those biotic infection, those biotic interactors may be affected by the spatial pattern of the sky islands. So even if our species could be moving and getting to other patches, maybe its key biotic interactors cannot. So that was probably the most direct um, feedback about the sky island system per se. Thank you, Robert. Um, okay, so we have group nine and then group uh, with Gonzalo and then group 10 with Alicia. We're a bit over the time, but I think we're having a good discussion. So we'll just close out uh, briefly later. Thank you. Okay, uh, so in your group, we have uh, people for different backgrounds, some paleontologists, some paleogeographer, biogeographer, myself, and also a human a geographer. So it was a little bit tricky to focus the discussion, but technically uh, first we discuss about uh, the importance to use uh, genomic data and ancient DNA, it, especially we are doing prediction in these systems and we need to look to the past. Um, these two tools, uh, but the genome and the ancient DNA uh, can give you these answers about, uh, especially in uh, glacial uh, systems, uh, well, that they are, the glacial cycles are, are uh, yes, affecting the system. So it's important to, this, uh, to incorporate all this part, uh, all this data. Also, uh, uh, thanks for Rachel that it was uh, the, the human geographer. Also, uh, she mentioned that it's important uh, for the conservation of the sky islands incorporate the social and the political components. Something that especially maybe uh, us in, in academic, we don't think too much about it, but yes, it's very important uh, to, to incorporate all these uh, components. But also uh, we discuss a little bit uh, about that there is difference of the threats uh, on the sky islands, uh, that the problems that are having uh, the sky islands in the US are very different of the problems that uh, are experienced right now uh, the sky islands in Mexico, especially that in the US, um, one of the main threats is uh, con farming and ranching, in the, in, but in Mexico, we are talking about uh, the presence of illegal groups. So, Yes, it's a very different uh, ways in where we can approach uh, for the conservation of sky islands. And I think that, that's it. Thank you, Gonzalo, very much. Um, Alicia. Thank you very much. Um, so our group was in Spanglish and it was very interesting nonetheless. So we had Claudia and I have to say, I don't know which Claudia because I think there are three. Uh, Travis Knowles, Saida Areri Munoz, Betsy Fuentes, and Julia Chacon, who kindly took notes in both languages. Um, so I think we can summarize what we discussed briefly as that we need to put attention into the matrix where the sky islands are in depth. That is not only in the process that are happening in the sky islands, but in the landscape that is within them. Especially, we have to look at what are the social issues there that will prevent conservation. Uh, and we have to look if conditions for corridors, present or future, will be maintained. Or if, for example, there is a city in the middle which will prevent a population from moving, even if uh, SDM models say so. Uh, for this, we can use remote sensing, climate change models, and biodiversity records data to analyze this kind of hypothesis. Um, we also need to know which sky islands are really connected, both uh, presently or to the past. For this, of course, we need genetic data, but also uh, on the lack of genetic data, this can also be analyzed with behavioral studies. For example, looking at bird songs, if they are too different, maybe this means that these populations have been isolated for longer periods. And in a nutshell, that's it. That was group 10. Thank you very much. One minute left. Good luck, Pablo. Closing. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, we have just eh, not even a couple minutes, but um, so just to close out, and I guess we can all agree that 
that it was an incredible rich discussion. And uh, uh, I think we have some common themes that basically reflect the study systems that we have, because we can see sort of the, how the need to bridge and connecting different scales and having islands of knowledge not being islands necessarily, and, and you know, needing, and, and also types of data between difference between Mexico and the US and difference between the skylines and the Northern skylines in the South. Um, I, I see a lot of, uh, you know, interest also in, in looking at finer scale resolutions, uh, maybe with molecular techniques, genetic techniques, but also with uh, for physio ecophysiology and, and, uh, and landscape approaches based on computing and, and remote sensing. Um, so we have those common themes. I also want to just uh, clarify this. So some of you mentioned the need to better communicate and communicate with government agencies. Um, very, we are actually working very closely with CONAMP uh, uh, as practitioners to try to actually form clusters of researchers research from different universities around the needs of specific parks in the Sky Island regions, right? Like Baviste, for example, right? Or maybe Hanos or maybe some other places. And I will, I, I will invite you to stay in touch uh, with me, with the group too, because we, we really want to hear from you, but also we want you to listen to the government agencies that are in charge, both in the US and in Mexico. And I think this particular session might actually be the starting point of something really productive around that. So if you get in touch with me, I'm very happy to provide the information and how we're progressing with that. So thank you very much uh, uh, for joining today. I'll see you all of you on next Friday um, with another very uh, interesting round of, of presentations and uh, uh, have a really good weekend and uh, yeah, be well. <laughs>